from. The magic with magnetic fields, I want to talk about a couple topics uh, that center around two applications. One is uh, football tracking, and the other one is enhanced wireless power transfer. What links them together is the physics. So I'm going to talk a little bit about magneto-quasi-statics. And uh, my student actually came up to me and started using this word, and I actually had to look it up and practice saying it. Uh, so the magneto means we're dealing with magnetic fields, and the quasi-static basically means the mathematics and the physics looks just like it does when it's static, but it just changes slowly with time. And that means we can treat all of our problems almost like a static problem, uh, which makes things much simpler. All right, so we're going to just do a little bit of a mathematical background of what do we mean by quasi-static. Um, and so what we've got here are Maxwell's equations for the full wave, and then we have the static. And if you remember, it's the E here, and the E here, and the B there, and the B there. It's the cross-coupling that creates propagating waves. So if we remove the cross-coupling, we stop propagating waves, and we end up just with uh, static fields. This is not particularly useful because we just have a, an electric field due to charge or a magnetic field due to current. What we want to be able to do is sense these fields. So it's nice if we can get these to change with time, and we can sense. So magneto-quasi-static says, well, we're basically going to have either the electric or the magnetic field change a little bit with time. And what we can do is we can create an electric field from that time-changing magnetic field. So we're going to use this piece here, and we're going to cross out that piece and that piece. So in electro-quasi-statics, we generate a magnetic field from a changing electric field. Here, an electric field from a changing magnetic field. So we basically crank up the frequency just enough so that we actually have some time-varying effects. And that allows us to sense. Because if we didn't have a time-changing field, we couldn't sense anything with an antenna. And if you look at uh, the fields from like a dipole antenna, this is in terms of lambda. Uh, the red here is the radiating field. This is what will be propagating out from an antenna. And the green is the non-radiating field. And basically, when you're about a hundredth of a wavelength close to a dipole, all you're seeing is this quasi-static. So everything we're going to talk about with quasi-statics means we're much we're very close to the originating antenna. And typically, our wavelength is going to be around a kilometer. And we're going to be within 100 meters of it. So we're certainly within a tenth and oftentimes within a hundredth of what we have. All right, so that was a lot of mathematical and physics background. Let's get on to the fun of tracking an NFL football. Um, can you tell me, uh, what team is this here? Oh, OK, I'm sorry. Uh, so this is NC State and Georgia Tech game. Uh, so what we wanted to do is we wanted to figure out how we can track this little football here. And part of the problem in doing this is, if you notice, um, there's a lot of players around the ball. Now, uh, there's a new technology out, Zebra, that's going out in the NFL. And they're actually putting little sensors, I believe, on the shoulder pads. And that works really great if I want to track this player running down the field. But if my antennas are behind them, and I've got one, two, three, four, five guys surrounding him, if he had that football tucked in, I couldn't see the football. I might see some shoulder pads, but not all of them, but I couldn't see the football. And what our technology is trying to do is try to be able to see that football. And we use magnetic fields for one simple reason. To a magnetic field, everybody here is transparent. That's why we use magnetic fields. If it was an electric field, it would actually interact with all of these, and it would be blocked. And so propagating waves generally aren't propagating through the players because the electric field is getting absorbed inside. And so our goal was to develop an accurate position and orientation system. Uh, it needed to be less than an ounce, because that's the variation in an American football. And we wanted to go 50 meters, so we could go basically across the field. If you think about any antenna, is at least 50 meters within where the ball would be. And we're using magneto-quasi-statics. And once again, it's because we want magnetic fields, because people are transparent to them. <clears throat> and we need magneto-quasi-statics, because we need a time-varying field and able to sense anything. And so the benefits are we can have non-line of sight, which just means we can see through people. We can see through small metallic objects. Um, and there's no multipath. For those of you that study radio, radio and RFID, there's a lot of issues with multipath. And that's just waves bouncing off other images. Well, there's no wave propagation here, so it just is static. It's basically the football emits a field, and that just propagates outward. The challenges are signal-to-noise ratio and image contributions, and I'll talk a lot about those. 
So this is an overview of existing positioning systems, and these are all propagation-based systems. So propagation-based meaning it's using a wave that's propagating through the air like your cell phone or GPS. And we have distance and resolution and also scale. Um, so we're able to get uh, high resolution and uh, with the GPS is here, UWB and RFID are here, we've got Zigbee, Bluetooth, and a lot of these areas. What we're missing though is something here in the center. And um, what we looked at were low frequency techniques and there was some out there that got about a meter accuracy and had a range of about 50 meters. And then there's another magnetic technology that's out there that actually came 30 years ago that has very high accuracy, down to a few centimeters, but it only has a distance of one meter. What we need is 50 meters of resolution with around 10 centimeters, sorry, 50 meters of distance with around 10 centimeters of resolution. And the reason why we need 10 centimeters is basically, although we all think when they do the first down and they bring the chains out, that it's right on, and if that football is a half an inch behind, no go, half an inch over. Uh, statistically, they figure the accuracy of the refs and the chains are about half a football. So if you're able to get a tracking system that's better than half a football in accuracy and resolution, you're doing just about as well as the chains are. The viewer won't agree with that, but the engineers will, will, will look at the statistical distribution of the chains and the refs and uh, see that it's an equivalent system. So let's talk about low frequency magneto quasi static. So we're operating in this quasi static region, so less than a tenth or a hundredth of a wavelength. And that's so that we really see the static fields. And at three megahertz, that's 100 meters, uh, we're operating at 350 kilohertz. So this is going to be out at a kilometer is the wavelength we're dealing with. And so uh, the fields don't interact. And, and the way to think about it is, there's something that all the electrical engineers know called a skin depth for a field. And if the object is less than a skin depth in size, it's transparent. And the human body at 350 kilohertz has a skin depth of around about a meter. So we're transparent. Anything much larger than a human could start to be something that might block it. But anything smaller like a helmet, the waves are going to go right through. Uh, there's no proximity problems and no line of sight. Like I said, we're transparent to magnetic fields. Okay. So this is a basic idea how this all works. We're going to have an emitter, which in our example is going to go in the football. And it's going to emit a magnetic field with a familiar shape that looks like this. And we can write out a mathematical equation of the magnetic field. And R and M are the vectors of uh, the geometry that we're using here. And what we're using is Faraday's law of induction, which says that if we put uh, if we look out here and make a loop, the voltage on that loop will be proportional to the frequency and the magnetic field. And this is why we need quasi-statics. We need this little frequency dependent. If we just had a static magnet, we couldn't measure things as easy. And what we're going to do is determine the orientation and the distance based upon the voltage we read. So this is the key uh, aspect of Faraday's law that's going to let us sense this magnetic field. And so what we do is we just place a receiver out there with a loop. And any magnetic field that goes through that loop creates a voltage, and we can measure it here at the receiver. And one thing I just want to point out here is, is the voltage is proportional to the magnetic field B, but also omega. And it turns out that that's really the knob we play with. If you go up higher in frequency, the voltage is higher. If you go lower in frequency, the voltage is lower. The reason why we don't just turn up the frequency higher and higher and higher to get a higher voltage is that, remember, we've got to be like within a tenth or a hundredth of a wavelength. As you go up in frequency, the wavelength gets smaller and smaller. So as we try to increase our signal by increasing our frequency, we reduce the size of that quasi-static range. We reduce that area where the body is transparent. And so we've got to be careful when we, check this, when we pick this frequency so we can maximize the signal but still operate in the quasi-statics. All right. So what we do is we set up our emitter and receiver. And I can actually write the received voltage on the receiver V here in terms of all of this based upon the emitter here. All you need to know is that if you tell me what this emitter is, I have math that tells me exactly what the voltage is going to be there. I know what the equation is. There's no guessing. Physics tells me this. And there's five unknowns. There's x, y, z, and theta, and phi. Theta being up, phi being the angle. 
And uh, if we have five unknowns, if we have five signals, five receivers, we can actually figure out our orientation from this. So basically, because there's a mapping of the field from here to here, I know what it is due to physics. If I measure a voltage on five different receivers, I can tell you exactly where that emitter is. It's a known problem. So here's some of the trade-offs, and this is some of the reasons why people choose different technologies. So here's our source. This maybe is our emitter. And we're going to talk about a couple challenges. So in the quasi-static issue, when the source is electrically close to the conducting ground, what does that mean? It means when my football is close to the Earth, it is actually going to, the magnetic field will generate currents in the Earth that will then re-radiate fields that go out. And so if I'm sitting out here, I'm going to see the field from my red dot and also the fields from the Earth. So I can't ignore the Earth. And um, it's something I have to take into account. One way to get around this, and the way that people have done this historically in uh, low frequency sensing, is they're just going to have their area of interest really close to the source. So that anything that's happening down here doesn't affect me, because I'm so close to the source that it dominates. And so they were very close. The other thing is they reduced the frequency to be very low. And as they reduce the frequency, the wavelength gets longer, and the effect from the Earth below here goes to zero. So they basically picked a domain where all of the challenges of low frequency sensing go away. And uh, they've done a great job, and they've gotten one centimeter of accuracy, but their zone is about one meter in distance. So we've got to go to 50 meters. And so here's the challenge for us, is we want to go out 50 meters. And so we've got to have a strong enough signal to measure it, but if we have a strong enough signal, we're going to get these secondary fields, and we have to take those into account. And so we need to be able to measure close and far. And because we want to go out 50 meters, as I said before, the way we get the voltage to increase is by turning up the frequency. As we turn up the frequency, the contribution from these secondary fields becomes bigger. So it's this trade-off. I want a higher signal, but a higher signal also gives me these secondary fields. And if you haven't guessed it, what I have to do is figure out a way to compensate for these. And so what we do is we use something called complex image theory. And what I'm going to do is cover what basic image theory is, and then I'll talk about what complex image theory is. And then we'll just get into the results, and we've got a cool video we can show you. So what I've got here is the source. So this might be my football or emitter. And if I have a conducting plane with infinite uh, conductance there, uh, Sommerfeld in 1909 said that I can write the magnetic vector potential. It's defined here in this form that's known. And we can actually separate out this equation into two pieces. And we can say, if I'm sitting over here, I see the fields due to the source and the fields due to a classical image. This is sort of sophomore level e &M, right? Classical images. If I then say that, well, this isn't a perfect conductor, but it has some conductivity between uh, zero and infinity, so it's not a perfect conductor, uh, it turns out Somerville actually wrote the equation also. The problem is, this little thing on the right is pretty nasty. And if we go back and look to the previous equation, we actually have a solution for this that's pretty trivial. We don't have a solution for this that's pretty trivial. So this is the part that basically is coming from the Earth. It's the nastiness that we have to take into account. And the reason why we need to include it is because we need 50 meters of range, and we need a high signal. So we have to crank up the frequency, and we can't ignore it. So Wait said, let me play the following trick. Let me take uh, this equation, and all I'm going to do is just split this exponential into two pieces, minus lambda alpha and lambda alpha. And mathematically, this is exactly the same as that. It's all of the engineers know. And then what he did is he said, let me take this alpha, and I'm going to play around with it a little bit. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take this thing on the right, and I'm just going to call it f. And here's F written out as a Taylor series expansion. And what he noticed was is I've got a term with alpha and a term with alpha. What if I could pick alpha so that this went to 0 and this went to 0? And then I would have higher order terms and 1. And so that's exactly what he did is he said, let me set this equal to 0. And actually, he could do that, and the first term cancels. This is what alpha equals and delta equals. And he could then cancel this and cancel the second term. 
and that equals zero, that equals zero, and he turns f into this simpler function. All he had to do was add this little extra alpha here. And why is this so important? Because this image is at h distance below the Earth. All we're saying is it has a different distance. It's sort of like a, a, a approximation for it. And so this was the key, was by finding this alpha, he could make this first term one, and he could rewrite the equation as an exponential with alpha, and then some higher order terms that we'll just ignore. And so what you end up with is the same source from here, and the fields from the Earth are a complex image that has been moved down by alpha over two. So all he basically said is take your known mathematics, we're going to change the effective depth of your image, and we're also going to change its phase, and that'll allow us to calculate what the fields are on the outside. And the reason we want to know what the fields from the Earth are is when we, when we measure something out in the football field, we're measuring what's coming from the football, and we're also measuring what's coming from the Earth. And if we know the relationship for everything, we can figure out by inverting it what it's going to be. All right. There will be no more mathematics after this, okay? So here's our first test. There's our football. Here's a loop, and we're going to take the football and run it along a length of line, and we're basically going to measure the magnetic field this measures from the football uh, emitting a field. And don't worry, we'll get in to show you exactly how that football does the magnetic field. And here are the results for 1D. Red is free space, so if we ignore the Earth. Green is classical image theory, and this is as if the Earth was a perfect conductor. And blue is complex image theory, and there's our measurements. And what you can see is we really do have this complex image phenomena as we move out. So if we picked either red or green, we'd have a lot of error at far distances or a lot of error at close distances. But by using complex image theory, I basically can figure out what the field should be. And this is important because now that I know this, if I measure this field magnitude and I'm calibrated, I can tell you exactly how far away I am. And here is the error. We had an estimated position error of, uh, looks like it's bouncing up and down between 20 centimeters. So it's not bad. It's about the size of a football. Um, and here is the RMS and peak. So RMS uh, dips down to about 15 centimeters for one day. So that's pretty good. So about less than the size of a football. And this conductivity is about us guessing how much conductivity the Earth has, how much like a conductor is it. What we did is we just put in values and found the minimum error and said, let's use that for our value. And we pretty much stayed around this value. And if you go look up what scientists have published, this is close to um, something that might be reasonable for Pennsylvania where the tests were done. We then did a human body effect where we actually took uh, four people and we took two loops and we basically moved them between the two loops. And what we found is that uh, this is the change in distance due to them moving between the two. And what we found is if we're around two to 400 kilohertz, 200 kilohertz, sorry, 400 kilohertz, two megahertz, uh, there really is no effect. So as long as our frequency is low enough, it's like we said before, the human body is transparent. At 13 megahertz, the human body starts to absorb. And this is important because RFID is operating starting at 13.5 or UHF is operating at much higher frequencies. So the human body is going to block that. We then went off to do 2D positioning. And before, it didn't matter whether the football emitted the fields and the antenna measured it, or the antenna emitted and the football measured it. But if you're going to build a real system, it's much easier to start with a emitter that is transmitting and then have a bunch of receivers around the field. It just makes the system easier to do. And what we built initially was we just put a bunch of lines of uh, a wire around a plastic disk, and we built a little circuit oscillator. And so that's going to be uh, like a magnetic dipole. If you have no idea what a magnetic dipole is, think about a bar magnet. You've probably seen the iron filings that go around that. It's doing a magnetic field just like that, or very similar to that. Uh, we had to do a bunch of field testing, so we built some amplifiers that would take the signals from our antennas back to our computer. And here's the measurement set up. So here's our field. Here's uh, some antennas. We had some fixed mounted antennas here. And all this is is a large loop antenna. And these lines right here are just holding uh, little reflectors because what we needed to do was know exactly the position of all of our antennas. And we used a laser like surveyors do for that. And here's our setup here and our little, our little laser sight that would position everything. So the first thing we did is we used optical surveying equipment to figure out where each and every antenna was and also where the loop was. And then we set the gain, so we basically calibrated each antenna. 
Uh, we're using a digitizer on the computer to receive the signals. And then what we did is we just moved this emitter in a systematic way around the field. And once we had the values, we used MATLAB to solve for the position. And we basically, the way we did it is we said, we know the relationship between the loop and the transmitter. We know what we measure from five receivers. What must the position be to give us those fields? And MATLAB basically goes in and does a, a nonlinear optimization to, uh, to solve that. And so here's our results. Um, these are color coded in X and Y. And what you can notice is this is the XY error due to each receiver. Every receiver has some high error points. We think these are pipes in the ground. I think there's a chain link fence here. But what we do is we put them all together to give an average error. And so here's the average error for the XY. Uh, so these are errors of uh, less than a half a meter is a dark blue. And we get all the way up to a few points that have pretty high error. So here's the average error. So 50% of our measurements are below 40, um, 40 centimeters, so about that much accuracy. And this is over a 30 by 30 meter. So basically, this that much accuracy over a football field. Um, and one thing we realized is if you go back and look here, we've got some receivers that have some ugly points. What if we just dropped out receiver four for these, these points? We already have seven. We only need five, so let's just ignore that basically cherry pick the best measurements. And when we do that, we're actually able to reduce our error down to here, where 50% of our measurements had 30 centimeters of average error. So we did pretty well for two-dimensional. Um, we then went and did three-dimensional, so doing x, y, z, theta, and phi. And so here's seven receivers. We have x and y errors. And we played the same trick where we picked the best five, and we were able to reduce the error down. And uh, I don't have the phi and theta, but we're basically able to receive about three degrees in direction of the ball. It's pretty cold, because you think about a running back with the ball, we just see him running. But that ball is actually going up, over, and then it's going back and down. And we can actually track this movement and this movement. We have 10 degrees of accuracy this way in addition. And so... In tonight's What's Next, we're talking football, literally the football, and new technology that could make watching the game even more exciting because local researchers have come up with a way to track the ball at all times, even in a pileup. The trackable football is what's next. During controversial plays, it allows you, the fan, to ref at home. So if they could do a replay and show you exactly on screen where the ball went throughout the play, you'd get a better feel of what the play was. The research team compares this ball tracking technology with what fans have grown to expect, that yellow line indicating the first down. We want to know where the yellow line, right. you know, where the first down is, and that helps us do it. The refs have their chain, so they don't need the yellow line. So it's more about sports visualization and bringing the, the viewer into the game. So here we have someone walking a football down the goal line. And what you can see on the right is a graphical representation of the field. And the circle represents the uh, person walking the ball. And the yellow arrow represents the direction of the ball. And when we get to the end, you'll actually see that arrow change as they turn around. And now we're going to see the same person walk down the line, but this time they're rolling the ball. So the ball's in contact with the ground. And what you can see in this experiment and the previous one is that um, the center of the ball is almost on the goal line and that we're plus or minus about a half a football width or a half a foot um, either side. We do have some peak deviations, but overall we have really good accuracy across 50 yards along the field, both being carried and on the field. So this is going to be in a demonstration of a, uh, with an actual team. You can see our sensing antennas are placed around the field. And they're done in random orientations, but we actually measure those orientations to do the um, um, visualization. And so now we're going to watch the ball being tracked. And the arrows show the orientation of the ball. And as you can see, the player runs down, runs to the left. And you can see the arrows there tracking the orientation of the ball along the field back to the goal line and now they're going to run to the sidelines. Now let's take a quicker look at the orientation. Uh, the red line is showing the orientation along the field and the yellow line is showing the projection of the ball which represents its angled upward. 
And so now let's watch this again, and you can see the red line is showing the orientation in the XY, and the yellow is showing how it's being pointed up or down. And it's interesting because you can see the ball really does move quite a bit as the player runs with it. Now the player is going to grab the ball and run suicide sprints where he's just going from one line to the next. And you can see the ball and its orientation on the right in our um, visualization field. And what's interesting is if you look at this uh, zoom out, just look at the player's feet. And if any, if you look over to the right, you'll notice that uh, the ball actually never gets to any of the lines. Typically, our eyes focus on the feet of the player and not where the ball is. And we're going to do a zoom up of this next. And so this is what's interesting, is you can actually notice that where the ball is and where the player's feet are are not the same place, even though uh, that's visually what we're, we're interpreting. So if you look closer, you can see that ball usually is about a yard out from the lines. And if you look at the uh, visualization on the right that we've done with the tracking system, you can see we clearly see the ball. Uh, and you can also see the orientation changes. Now we're going to do a few plays. This is a running play. Hands it off, and you can see the player running down the field. Uh, now we're going to do a passing play. Um, the ball goes back to the quarterback. There's a little bit of delay, and you can see then the player catch it. And you can also see it tracked as it was flying through the air. And here we're just having uh, a group of players pile on the ball, and this is just showing that we can continue to track the ball even though players are on top of it. This is everybody's favorite uh, part of the video. This is building the ball. So we remove the bladder, and then we wind the antenna around the bladder, and we deflate it and insert it back inside of the ball. Here, we're attaching the circuits and epoxying them so that when somebody kicks it, uh, we don't actually break the circuit. And then the last part is actually the hardest, which is lacing the ball back together. Uh, this took uh, the person there doing this quite a few hours to figure out how to do it. But once we're done, we're just going to inflate the ball, and we're ready to go. I demonstrated the first 3D low-frequency magnetic system. The future work is twofold. One is to making it real time, and the second one is finding somebody who wants to buy it. So, anybody has a couple million dollars, let us know.